Brasilia is just the most fascinating place. It's a city that is one of the most ambitious single building projects ever. <laughs> there is nowhere that I can think of that has quite the same sense of space. It has colossal skies. I've never been anywhere quite like that. It's a place that you can fly over and it looks like nowhere else. It's a, a city that, that's placed right in the centre of the country and it is imagined as being uh, somewhere that will open up the, the whole country for development. Brazilia's got a really long history. It, it's a creation of a very short period in some ways, but the idea of opening up the interior of Brazil by establishing an inland capital had been around for about, uh, well, the best part of a century. So the people were talking about it um, in, in the, the, towards the end of the Portuguese uh, colonial uh, period. And then in the, the 1891 constitution, there is provision for a new capital uh, somewhere in the middle of Brazil. It doesn't say any more than that, but that, that's the, the, the beginning of the process. Um, the, the modern founding of Brasilia starts very precisely in 1955. The then governor of the, the state of Minas Gerais, uh, Juscelino Kubitschek, uh, was campaigning to be president and on the stump in 1955 someone asked him what was going to happen with this plan in the constitution to build a new capital and he said very simply we will implement the constitution and so for better or worse he won the election became president and in 1956 he was faced with the decision of uh, whether to uh, go ahead with this this promise and well he did uh, and he knew that he was going to have to finish it somehow in four years because that was the length of the presidential term. So to create an entirely new capital from scratch in the middle of nowhere was uh, an extraordinarily ambitious thing to try and do. A competition was held uh, in 1956 uh, and 26 people entered, 26 uh, architectural firms entered from all over the world. It was a, there was an international jury. And in the end, the winner was a firm, or in fact an individual, Lucio Costa, a Brazilian planner and architect who hadn't entered, but was friends with Kubitschek and with the main architect involved in the central part of Brasilia, Oscar Niemeyer. Nehemiah had already been selected to create the monumental buildings in the centre of the city. Costa produced an extraordinary non-competition entry. It's very simple, it's just on a, on a handful of file cards and it has some very crude sketches and it begins and it says, you know, dear committee, I'm not really entering this competition but I've just had this idea and it's kind of sprung to me, I thought you ought to know about it. It's a very simple graphic plan for a city and in the end through a, a kind of stitch up through you know friends talking to each other uh, he won. He was given the job of producing this city. And there was a building process that so lasted two and a half, four years and it was inaugurated on uh, 21st of April 1960. Lucio Costa's um, design for the city, his, his competition entry that's not a competition entry. It, it's a, a very poetic text that's primarily about what kind of um, symbols, what kind of forms do you need to make a city have the true characteristics of a capital city and a capital city that implicitly will last for forever. He wants something of that for Brasilia right from the beginning. 
So the kinds of reference points he puts in there are often historical reference points. To make a true capital city, you need different scales, you need a, a magnificent part, you need a ceremonial part, you need uh, a part that maybe is very informal and has little lanes and alleyways. The plan is startlingly clear from the air. It resonates with primal imagery. It's an aeroplane, it's a bird, it's a sign of the cross, depending on whose account you read. For me, it refers to the pioneering nature of that part of the city rather than the fact that it might look like a plane. So it's pilot, as in an experiment or prototype. Brazil you know, obviously had been in existence as, as an independent nation for um, 70 years, but it was very conscious of it being still a, a new nation, and you know, politically it, it's constantly reinventing itself. So the, the, there's always a sense of newness there. The rhetoric of Brasilia's architects was both liberatory and levelling, and the architecture was designed to bring about a social revolution. But the plan has also been described as conservative, even authoritarian. The crux of it is a great symmetrical boulevard on an essentially neoclassical plan. Some people think it's there to represent and uphold authority. The plan is basically a cross. The long axis is the Aisho Rodoviaria, or the, the highway axis, that's about 14 kilometres long. It's bisected right in the middle by a five kilometre Aishul Monumental, or the monumental axis. That's the axis that contains all of the government buildings. Right in the middle, where the two axes cross, is in a way not what you would think. You might think it would be you know, government buildings or something really monumental. It's not, it's the bus station. <laughs> And it, this is one of the most extraordinary bus stations on earth. It's a, a multi-storey complex. All human life is there. And it has a huge motorway going over the top. It's a very, very complex structure. It's the only part of the pilot plan with the density and richness of more traditional Brazilian cities. And it's a building largely used by the poorer classes, the people who are most likely to take the bus, even though it was intended to be a building all about movement and speed in modern Brazil. Along the monumental axis, there are clusters of government buildings. They're almost like um, almost platonic ideal forms, very pure, very white, very sculptural. They don't really look like buildings from Earth. Perhaps the most important is the square of the three powers of the Plaza dos Tres Poderes. And that has the Congress, the presidential palace is there, and it has the judiciary and this great big enormous plaza. Then a bit further down the monumental axis you've got Cathedral, which is one of the most iconic buildings in the city. It looks like a crown of thorns, where the thorns are the ribs of the cathedral. When people visit Brasilia, they tend to visit the monuments of the, the centre. They tend not to go to the residential areas. That's a pity in a way, because some of those areas are, are um, beautifully done. The residential parts are really a key part of the plan. They're normally known as super quadras or super blocks. A maximum of six storeys, so quite low, arranged in formal clusters. The architecture is, is not that interesting of, of itself, but as a group, these blocks create a, a really quite seductive environment with lots of planting, sometimes facilities like little cafes. The planning didn't abolish class distinctions by any means, but apartments in the pilot plan are suggestive of a more egalitarian way of living, even if such a transformation never really happened. If you want to see really good modernist planning, um, the super blocks are, are one of the places that you can see it. Brasilia today is a vast, sprawling metropolis. Only a small proportion of people live in the Plano Piloto, the pilot plan, the centre. Economically, it's one of the most successful parts of Brazil. The per capita income is very high. For a middle class, resident of the city, it, it appears to work very well. It's got a sense of uh, order and safety, relative tranquility that the big Brazilian cities on the coast don't generally have. It's still a place that's very divided between the centre and the periphery. 
There are many parts of the periphery which are very poor, where there are colossal divisions of wealth, where um, personal safety is not assured at all. But in general, compared to other Brazilian cities, it, it's regarded as a success. The centre of the city, the, the pilot plan, um, is often described as a, as a utopia. Um, it's, uh, and it's now preserved, it's now um, listed by um, UNESCO, so it, it's not possible to, to make any major changes to that. Niemeyer is a very, very distinctive architect. He got involved before the competition happened because he knew Kubitschek, the president, and the president already commissioned him to design some buildings for the new city. He's somebody who had worked with Le Corbusier early in the 20th century. He'd taken on board lots of the trends that were happening in Europe, but he, he'd added to that um, a sense of uh, sculpture or exuberance. <laughs> um, this is a, a version of modernism that is partly recognisable in European terms, but partly it does something completely new. What Nehemiah is particularly famous for is doing very bold things with concrete. Concrete is his material because of its plastic qualities, and also the fact that concrete's a material that needs a lot of labour, but labour in Brazil is very cheap, or at least it, it was uh, then. He loves to do pilotes or columns that maybe you know, taper to a very, very narrow point. He likes to do columns that appear to be upside down. He likes to do things that give you a sense of maybe roofs that are, that are floating or doing something impossible. He's become very influential. Architects like um, Zaha Hadid, maybe Daniel Liebeskind, who've built some of the most spectacular buildings of the last 20 or 30 years used Nehemiah as a reference point. I think Nehemiah was very concerned with experience. The kinds of forms that he was producing and the kinds of things that he was saying were not unlike the things that were said around surrealism. And he certainly knew about surrealism. He was in touch with many of the people in, in that movement in France at the time of it being produced. Some of his forms are like the things you would see in, in, in the painting of uh, Joan Miró, you know, great uh, Catalan artist. Nehemiah was very keen that we think of him as an artist. So if you were to visit his studio and he was still alive, you would be taken to a, a desk and you would, you would meet him and he, he would be somebody who, who would just sketch a few lines and then he would say that oh, I'm going to give this to my, um, my assistants now and they'll turn it into a building. So there was a sense that um, uh, at, a, at a fundamental level he, he regarded what he was doing as, as art and then the practical dimensions to the buildings, somebody else could look after that. I mean it, it was a bit of an act. He was a very skilled technician and, and uh, he, he knew about engineering but he, he, he wanted us to believe that he was an artist. Uh, and certainly, you know, everything that we know about the building suggests somebody who, whose interests were very much in, in form uh, rather than the, the function of the buildings. There's a number of uh, Nehemiah's buildings which uh, are criticised in, in those terms. The ministry buildings housing the civil service were built with so much glazing in a city that has some of the highest levels of sunshine in the world. They were basically uninhabitable at certain times of the day. With the cathedral, he designed it as a mostly a glazed structure. You enter the cathedral by going down into the ground. Some people said that this was a joke, that you, you, you ended up going into this hot, glazed structure by going underneath uh, the, the street level, so you were descending into hell. I don't know whether that's right or not, but it's an amazing piece of sculpture. Nehemiah was an atheist. He wasn't a, a, a believer at all. He was a very active member of the Brazilian Communist Party. So who knows if this uncomfortable effect was intentional. In all of his work, he is thinking of the viewer having an experience that, that takes them out of the everyday world. 
that kind of shocks them. He often used that word. He wanted to shock and surprise visitors. He wanted to take them out of the ordinary world, to take them somewhere else, to think, you know, I, I've never seen something like that before. The character of Brasilia that people often remark on is the way that it looks like it's come from another planet. Uh, that was exactly what Nehemiah was after.